letter are, are just uh, ultimately like a, a beautiful uh, love letter. It's this interaction between Paul and the, the sheep in Thessalonica. Uh, remember, he had been there for only a short period of time and, and had been run off, and now he's writing back to encourage them. But ultimately, he's writing back to encourage them after already hearing word of how God is working in their lives. And that encouraged him, and so therefore he wants to encourage them with the news. And, and in chapter 3, um, we get the report of the news. And basically the way this works out is, is that, remember, Paul had left, and when Paul went on down to Athens, he becomes aware and is concerned, as we saw last week, that the church in Thessalonica was struggling or they were under attack because he had been under attack there. And so he knew that they would be persecuted and had told them such. And so his concern for them was, I hope they're doing okay. I hope they're hanging in there. And so what did he do? He sent who to find out how they're doing? Does anybody remember? Who did he send? Timothy, that's right. He had sent Timothy up there. And then in light of that, Timothy had returned with what? Good news. Good news that the church is doing well. And in light of that, Paul writes this letter. And that's really the occasion for him writing the letter. In chapter 4 and 5, we'll see more of the doctrinal issues that he would be dealing with and kind of developing. But in the first three chapters, it's more all about what you know. You know these things about how I was there initially with you, and you know uh, how much we love you. We know, you know these truths. He's kind of bringing back to mind uh, their awareness of him. So what we've been doing is kind of walking down through the passage and just answering uh, questions from the passage. i got to text my tech man here and tell him, play. <laughs> there we go. We have somebody actually remote doing that. Hey, Sam, could you do that? Could you go back there? He did it. All I had to do is push the play. How about that? Isn't that cool? He's, uh, ben is in a different location watching on a screen and can push a button on our computers to make everything work. Are we not living in a weird world? <laughs> Strange how that can happen. Uh, hi, Ben. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You'll probably write something up on the screen. <laughs> hi. <laughs> no problem. Uh, needless to say. All right. So we're, we're talking about how they know, they know Paul. Paul's kind of reminding them of how they understand what they're all about. They know their heart towards them. And then Paul is then telling them what they're thankful for. So let's read 1 Thessalonians 3 again. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified. Sorry, looking at 2 Thessalonians. Did you see that? That was quick. Close. One book over. 3, 1, here we go. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And here we, you see this, he's telling them. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer afflictions. And so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith. For fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith, and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we Rejoice before our God on your account. 
as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus, Christ, Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people just as we do for you. So that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. You see it? It's beautiful, isn't it? The way that he's talking, you can just see the compassion, the love, the gentleness, the affection that he has for these people. You can see how much he is concerned for them. He kind of rehearses and goes back and says, this is why we were concerned. And he starts in chapter 3. You see, this was the, the outline that I had showed you last week that was very, uh, an exegetical outline that kind of laid it out real clearly. You see in verse 17 of chapter 2 to 3, 13, Paul and Silas were frustrated in their travel plans and wanted to go there, but a solution was arrived at. And the solution was to send Timothy to find out how they were doing. Do you understand? And so... That section kind of lays it out that they desired to go, but Satan had kept them from going. And Timothy had carried out this reconnaissance mission, which is chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. And then after that, Timothy returns in chapter 3, verse 6, and gives the report in 3, 6 to 10, which conveyed this joyful information about how they're doing and, and what's going on. And then the new information makes Paul and Silas break out in prayer. And we'll talk about the prayer tonight. We'll spend most of our time on that, Lord willing, to see what a biblical prayer looks like. It's revealed beautifully here for us to examine. Again, the therefore, as in light of us not being able to get there, there's this great concern when we could endure it no longer. They are what? We thought it may be best left behind in Athens, so he does what? He sent Timothy. They sent Timothy, and what, how's Timothy described? Who is Timothy? Our brother? Right, so is, is Paul a brother? Is, is Paul's brother Timothy in the flesh? Probably not. We know he isn't. Why? Because Timothy was what? He was actually half Gentile, half Jew, right? And Paul was a Pharisee, Remember? Back in Acts, where he has to, he circumcises him to not be offense to the Jewish people as he goes there. All right, so it's a brother in the faith and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ. And so, what was he supposed to do? What was he sent to do? What was Timothy sent to do? Strengthen and encourage them. Strengthen and encourage them. And did he do it? I would assume he did in light of his return. But they ultimately strengthened and encouraged Timothy because he brings back this great news, right? And so it goes both ways. So what's the purpose? What was the purpose of Timothy going? Well, do you see the little so that phrase in verse 3? So that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. So his, his idea was is go and strengthen and encourage them so that when the afflictions come, they won't be disturbed by it. It won't cause them to crash, right? So that's the point. What does it assume for these believers in Thessalonica? They're going to face what? Persecution. It's coming. It's coming. So they needed to be strengthened and encouraged so that they could face it, right? And then... Why should they not be disturbed by these afflictions? He gives a reason why they should not be disturbed by the afflictions that are coming and came. What is it? Verse 3. For you yourselves know. What? That we have been destined for this. What's the word destined mean? Destined. The English word destined. Prearranged. It's prearranged. So, so why should they not be disturbed by the afflictions? Because it's prearranged. It's destined for them to what? Go through it. 
Now, let me ask you a question. Does that, how does that make you not get disturbed by an affliction when it comes upon you? How does knowing that it's destined help you to walk through it when it comes? Okay. In a spiritual sense, you know that it's from God and you can rely on it. Amen. Good job. That's really good. Good thought process of us thinking through it. If we know that it's not catching God off guard, we know God's in complete control, and that when bad things happen to us, we go, oh, yeah, I should have known. Yes, I remember. This is destined for me. Do you understand? It, it prepares us, and we're able to walk through it and persevere through it, right? And ultimately, it's about what? Trusting God, trusting him. And one of the main themes that's found in chapter 3 is this idea of faith. Again, it's repeated, faith, dependence, trust, commitment, understanding that God is in control. Ultimately, our faith, is a recognition that God is sovereign over all events that are happening, right? Faith is recognizing and depending and trusting in the sovereign God that's in control of all things. All right. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer afflictions, and so it came to pass, as you know. Again, what's he do? He rehearses it again. He says it again. He says, when Paul... When did Paul teach them that God ordains afflictions for his own? He taught them the first time he was there, right? Guess what? And by the way, if it's a new believer, often we think that we have to coddle new believers, don't we? What do we often think with a new believer we need to tell them what? Oh, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be great. God is good. Everything's going to be beautiful, you know, just come on, come hang out with us. It's going to be okay. What's the reality? No, affliction's coming. I'll never forget that the day after I got saved, I walked into my company, and I did not know this. I had no clue. Y'all are going to think I'm nuts. The day after I got saved, I walked into my company that I owned with 12 salesmen and said, I'm a believer in Jesus. And they looked at me and said, who's Jesus? Is he God or is he a man? I said, he's the God man. And they said, um, many of them were Jehovah Witnesses. They said, no, he's not God. My affliction came what? Immediately. The next day. And within three months, all those Jehovah Witnesses quit and went to work for my boss, who was a Jehovah Witness. Does this happen? Is it normal? Is it, is it the way it is? Yes, it's destined. We should expect that things are going to be difficult. And God ordains this, but God will give us the grace and faith to trust and obey him through it and persevere through him. But we've got to keep our eyes on him and we've got to trust him, right? When did the example of the affliction first take place? Well, it happened with Paul, right? As soon as he gave them the gospel, what happens? He's run out of town, right? The Jewish people uprised against him and said, he's got to go. And then they chased him to Berea. So the gospel's going out in Macedonia, and what does the enemy want? It stopped, right? And that pattern is consistent. And then there's that repeated concept, as you know, as you know. You know it. Well, I've told you all this before it happens. Again, building faith and confidence and commitment in the one that loves them, right? All right, for this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So, question, for what reason did Paul send to find out their faith? What was his reason for sending them? Would get them. Yeah, and we kind of talked a little bit about of a, a tension last time. Do you remember the tension that we kind of talked about? What was the tension? 
that we know that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. But there's still this side of the human responsibility that we have to understand that it still can have concern that people could walk away, right? We know that he, those that are his, he will keep. But there's also this natural concern that will come as we shepherd and disciple people that we will warn them and we will pray for them and we'll seek to tell them that these things are going to be hard. So it's a both and, isn't it? We trust that God's going to work in people's lives, but we also do what? We encourage them. We seek ways to strengthen and encourage their faith so that they'll keep on. By the way, that would be, if you want to know what discipleship is, that's discipleship. It's a recognition that people need the Lord, and we are the, God's instrument to help encourage them and strengthen them and help them keep going even in the hardships. But all the time trusting in the sovereign God and praying for him to try, work in them. So it's a both and, isn't it? It's not an either or. Some people would say, oh, well, God started it, so just let it go. We're okay. No, that's not true. We've got to participate in making these disciples. Why did Paul send Timothy to find out about their faith? Well, fear that they might be tempted and our labor would be in vain. Interesting here, huh? He was afraid it was going to be a useless work that he was there. That's a wild thought, isn't it? Or the, that his labor among them was in vain. That's a wild thought, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Amen. And this, be, this is the heart of somebody that's trying to make disciples. There's this awareness that, did I do everything I'm supposed to in making that disciple? But there's also an awareness that God, it might not, they might not have really taken. It might also be that later on down the road they come to Christ, even though they didn't really get it. Some of us in the room would probably testify that, You've had waves or, or moments in your life when you first professed faith and you really didn't walk with Jesus for a long time, but then 20 years later, 10 years later, you now you're really walking with Christ? And you got it. Well, what was that? What was God doing back in? Well, he's laying seeds. and So there is still this awareness, right? And for all of us, is there concern in your heart for other people? This is one of the crucial elements that I want to bring out, is, is that he's others-focused. Again, it's, it's Paul's mindset, is, is that he's concerned about others. He's concerned. Is to have concern for others a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing in this set, in this context, isn't it? To be concerned that somebody continues on? Yes. It should be. Should we be proactive in trying to do things to help make sure that they're walking with the Lord? Yes. Does, do, does the Lord ever, and again, you know, this is, it's not going to blow any of you away. I think you can handle this. Does the Lord ever bring people to your mind that you're concerned for because of bad things or you might be concerned that something happened in their life? I believe that's the Lord working in our lives. Okay, so what do we do with that? We pray for them, and then we pursue them. We seek to help them, to love them. We don't have to be so frozen and chosen that we can't actually believe that God brings people to mind, right? I think that this is the idea of a discipler. A discipler has people on his heart all the time. He's always thinking about these other people. Very, very crucial. This is discipleship. And so what if you don't have people come to your mind and the only one you think about is yourself? What should you do? What should you do? Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What if you, <laughs> good it is for Karen? No, but I mean, if, you know, when you meet people and talk to people and, you know, people, I mean, you're just helping yourself. Amen. 
Amen. You got to pray for them. They come to your heart, right? Karen, I love, I love your, uh, how you just go right to the point. Yes, because you're so others focused. Now, we can all fall into the trap of being self-focused. And often when it's afflictions, right? When I get into afflictions, that's normally, that's when I get a little bit more consumed with myself. But here we have the Apostle Paul. They want him being afflicted, left alone. What does he do? He's still thinking about others. It really does. It gets us through those hard times when we're putting others' concerns above ourselves. Right? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Amen. You know, isn't this almost every epistle that Paul writes? He's got this encouraging line where he says, you know, your faith is spread. You, you know, you're coming to Christ. But there's also this concept of I'm concerned for you and I hope that you persevere. So there's this continuous like we need to encourage one another. We're we're called to be encouragers and and check on one another <coughs> and pray for one another by the way, that's why we have to be a part of a church, don't we? We need to be in a part of a church because a church, it's not just this one guy up here, the pastor that's reaching out to each other. We're all reaching out to each other all the time. We're all seeking one another and helping one another and encouraging one another because that's what the body of Christ does, right? Just like what he's showing as an example here, the same is true. And Paul says that, doesn't he? He says, when I get there, I'll be encouraged by your faith. In, in the beginning of Romans. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I love how Paul, when these people are in, in afflictions, he is so gentle and so wise in how he brings up that God is sovereign over all things and has done this. That's hard to do. That actually takes lots of prayer and lots of pursuing the Lord to give us the grace and the gentleness to do it in a way that doesn't smack them in the face but yet encourages them, right? Right? I, you can just see how God is working. So what do Paul and the church long for in, in verse 6? What do they long for? They long to see us. They, they long to be around us. You know, it's about being together. They want to be back together, right? All right. But now that Timothy has come, you can almost see the change, right? It's like it goes from... Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, to, yes, we got a good report. Here it is. It's the transition. It's the 
highlight of the letter. You could argue that this is like the thing, the good news. What's the good news? But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you, for this reason, brethren, in all of our distresses and afflictions, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. Wow, isn't this encouraging? Have you ever gotten one of those? Have you ever gotten a letter where you just said, Whoa, this is good. This is good news. What would be good news for us if we got a letter from somebody? Maybe it's uh, somebody we've witnessed to before, and they come right back to us, and they say, hey, I love Jesus. He's great. I'm reading my Bible all the time. Isn't he good? Those are the kind of things that bring the heart of a disciple maker to its pinnacle of joy. What is the thing that brings you the most joy? You know what it is? Seeing other people love Christ. Seeing other people dig into the word. Seeing other people sharing the gospel. That's what it's about, right? That's what we're about. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Tell her again, right? <laughs> you know what you, you know what you're doing? You're praising and thanking God for what He has do, done in her to help you, to encourage you. Ha! Huh. You're gonna see it's the exact same pattern. It's the same pattern because what happens is when we fully aware of what God's doing in the body of Christ. It is extremely encouraging. That's why being a part of a church is so instrumental. We can't do this by ourselves. God uses each other to encourage each other. And Paul does the same thing. Same thing. So what would be the most encouraging thing for the Thessalonians? Is, is They give this encouraging word to Paul. But you got to remember who's reading this. The Thessalonians. So that means he got encouraged, and then what did he do? He wrote and said that he was encouraged, which would do what to them? Encourage them to then do what? Persevere. Persevere. Endure. Continue on, even in the affliction. By the way, just by you telling her thank you and by you bringing it up again, I guarantee you that that will encourage her to persevere too. Which is what it's all about, right? You see how God works. Amazing, isn't it? For this reason. For what reason? For this reason. He says in verse 7. Brethren, in all of our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. Where were the missionaries comforted? Where were they comforted? They were comforted in our all our distresses and afflictions. So... Did Paul, by Paul leaving Thessalonica and then Berea and going to Athens, did he avoid affliction? I think it's very interesting here. 
Remember, he, was, he, he left Berea to do what? They said, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go. Why? Because they're coming after you. So he gets down there, and what happens there? More of it. It's more of it. It's wherever you go. If you're in Christ, you're going to have this, you're going to have it. I'm sorry, you can't run from it. Do you understand, beloved? That's what we're in. We're in these bodies of death, and on top of that, we're in a world that doesn't love Jesus. Right? We saw that Sunday. And so, do you think it's going to be hard? Yes, it's going to be hard. It's going to, there's going to be trials. But what encourages the missionaries? Other people persevering in the midst of their own afflictions. When I'm getting afflicted and I see others standing firm, I'm encouraged. You are too. One of, my, one of the reasons why I love the Snedekers so much is because I love to see what God's doing in their life and their distress and in their afflictions. How, even though it's hard, it's even impossible, they persevere, and in their perseverance, I'm encouraged in their perseverance. Same can be said of all of us, right? Read Johnny Erickson Tata and all the things that she's gone through. Or Elizabeth Elliot and all that she went through. What does that do? It encourages us. How were the missionaries comforted? In the second half, we were comforted about your, you through your faith. Their commitment to Christ, their faith, their trust in him in the midst of their trial that got back to them by report, encouraged them. It's not a gift, by the way. It wasn't a monetary, monetary gift. That wasn't the big thing. <laughs> the thing was faith, their faith. Their trust in Christ. What else? What is the result of the missionary's comfort through their faith? What is the result? For now, what? We really live. Well, the NASB adds it. <laughs> well, actually, the NASB does it. I'm sorry. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading it. I'm sorry. It wasn't me. I didn't put that in the translation. But we really live. Okay. So, again, this doesn't make, this is not how the world would think, right? The world wouldn't really live over somebody else enduring through persecution. How does the world really live? How does the world really live? Wealth, popularity more stuff, health, right, health. But what really encourages believers is other believers believing. Huh. What really lights your fire, what makes you really live? Seeing people thrive in their faith, seeing others go, I love Christ, and he's more important to me than anything else. That's what really gives me, makes me live. How about you? It's a, but it's a life that's based not on externals as much as it is on perseverance and faith in the midst of a persecution. That's where I really live. I don't know about you, but I, I have this prayer for my kids. And I will really live if that prayer request is answered. You know what that is? That they will love Jesus with all their heart, mind, and soul. And they will persevere in the faith. That's what I want for my kids. If they don't, if they're not millionaires, they don't make any money at all, they are uh, garbage men. And they dig ditches, and love Jesus, praise the Lord. I just want him, I just want him to know Christ. That's where we really live, right? Is that where we really live? 
What is the condition of the missionaries really living if they stand firm in the Lord? Just want them to stand firm in the Lord. Now we really live because you stood firm in the Lord, even in the midst of persecution. And so what do they do? What's he do? Here it is. He wraps it up. This is what this is the motivation for his prayer. By the way, this is so crucial. What is it that motivates us to pray? What is it that makes us go and pray? Often, and I'm confession time here, often my prayer is based on needs. Based on needs. But my his provoke to prayer is actually gratitude for what God's already done. He starts with gratitude. So here's my question in the room. What's your prayer life? Is it filled with gratitude for what God's already done? Are we thankful for what he's doing? Because he's done so much, hasn't he? In Christ for us, that alone is a reason to pray. We're thankful. But I'm thankful for this group. I'm thankful for our church. I'm thankful for the missionaries. I'm thankful for those things, right, that God is doing. And this is what happens. Look, what does the section appear to be? It describes a prayer that starts with gratitude, right? For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? Wow, what joy? What joy that we receive on your account? What's the point? Why do they have this joy? What is it that creates this joy and gratitude to God? What is it? You tell me. What, what was it? Why were they so joyful? Amen. That they were standing firm. That they were, they were standing firm. They were hanging in there. But if you're not others focused, by the way, if you're not thinking about anybody but yourself, you won't recognize what, what God's doing in other people. And then you won't have any reason to thank God. We have to, oh, Lord, give us a heart that sees what you're doing in other people. That would be a prayer that I have. That I'd be thankful for what he's doing. Show me what you're doing in other people's life. Right? And we rejoice before our God on your account. What does the good news of their faith and love, standing firm in the Lord, produce in the missionaries? Joy, gratitude, right? This appears to be a rhetorical or a hypothetical question. What thanks can we render to our God? Is, are they saying there's no thanks? Is there any thanks? No, he's, man, what amazing amounts of thanks we can give to God. That's what he's saying. For this report, such joy. Yay, way to go, God. You're good. Is this what our prayers look like? I confess my prayers are always, are often, not always, but often way too, oh, it's me, I didn't get this, will you do this, this looks bad, this is horrible. Lord, please give me a heart that sees what you're doing so that I can acknowledge with gratefulness all that you're doing. He's doing lots. What is the condition of the missionary's heart before the Lord because of the good news? It's filled with joy. In return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on a, your account. And then, what does the gratitude and joy over the good news cause the missionaries to do? Well, you've got it. You've arrived. So, I don't need to pray for you. No, it actually works the opposite, doesn't it? He's thankful for what they're doing, but it causes them to do what? Pray for more. So, the petition, the need is still there. Gratitude's expressed, but then need this naturally comes, but they still need you. They need you. 
So as we seek God and we're thankful for what God's doing, then we're then drawn into petitioning more. That's what they do. What do the missionaries want to do when they see the church in Thessalonica? That we may see your face and what? Complete what is lacking in your faith. Wait a second. Eric, I thought that these guys were doing so good. They were trusting the Lord. They were in affliction. What did they need? What? There's still an element to our faith needs to do what? It does. It's gross. That's, I mean, unless this is saying the opposite, it says it. That when I get there, I can complete what is lacking in your faith. What's lacking in our faith? Here's the problem, beloved. We don't stop, we don't stop in our understanding of God. The more we know God, the more we trust God. The more that we go and help other people know God more, the more they will what? Trust him. So he knows, I want to see your face so I can help you understand God more so that you will trust God more. So you will depend upon God more. So you will know he's faithful, right? So he thanks God for their faith, but he also what? Prays that he'll be able to see them so that he can complete what's lacking in their faith. Has your faith arrived? Oh, mine isn't. I need to know Christ more. I need to know the gospel better. I need to know God's word more. And this is what happens. What do the missionaries want to do when they get, see the church? They want to complete what is lacking in their faith. Who is the audience of 11 to 13? This is a trick question. Who's the audience of 11 to 13? Who's the audience? give you a, a hint. It's not one. Oh, it's not two. <laughs> it's everybody. Look, it's really interesting here because it's a prayer to God. So the audience would be God. God would be, it's a prayer to God, but it's written down for them to read, but also it's still standing for us to read. Right? This is an amazing thing about God's word. Now may God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. God may, may God, by the way, this is really, uh, did God already ordain whether or not Paul would go back through to Macedonia? This prayer, he's praying. Did God already ordain that they, he would go back to him? Yes. Why did he pray for it? Because in God's ordained plan, he's ordained the means as well as the end. It's the prayer. He ordained the prayer to move him, to direct him to go. So it's a both and. It's not an either or. When we pray, we what? We literally pray, God, please, let me go see these people again. And then God in his providence hears the prayer and works. Did God ordain for that prayer to already work? Yes. How do, what do we do with it? Leave it there and know that God is God and trust him. He ordains the means as well as the end. What is the prayer request? That they'll be able to go see them, right? Direct us to your way. And may the Lord cause you, what? To increase and abound in love. Okay, so my prayer, the prayer request is what? That they will increase and abound in love. Does love grow? Love grows. Do you increase in your love? Do you increase and abound in your love? Go ahead. I, I would say yes, because it would be that the Lord more and more loving, more and more, and the love increases, and that just depends on the love of the person. 
Absolutely. And so he's praying for them to increase in their love for, more, uh, for others more and more, right? Their commitment. How will we define love? Love is that commitment that's evidenced by sacrifice, right? We pray that you would be sacrificially committed more and more, that you would increase in your sacrificial commitment to one another more and more. Yeah. Amen. 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 So, you know, you actually prayed the same prayer the Apostle Paul prayed. But for yourself and for us, right? That we would increase in our love for one another. And we're praying that each other will increase in our love for one another. Right? Yes, sir. Can you tie end these to the Catholic and the faith and the end show about in the last day of the world? Complete what is lacking in your faith? Yeah. Well, ultimately, we would know, right? Yeah, I think ultimately, as you, as you understand who Christ is more, back to her thing, love the Lord your God with all your heart more and you will know him and you will love him more. And then if you love him more, then you will do, then love others more. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, may our God and Father do this. May he cause you to increase. It implies something. This is good news, by the way. Um, it comes from who? This, even the motivation and the heart commitment to others comes from who? does god causes us to love other people have you ever had somebody in your life you just like man you are hard to love <laughs> no that doesn't happen right anybody you are hard to love right <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what should those that we have a hard time loving, what should we pray for them and ultimately pray for ourselves? That God would cause us to love them more and more and increase in love towards them, right? The natural tendency for us when somebody, we don't love somebody or somebody just rubs us wrong is to stick out the hand and say, stay away. The Bible says go to God and ask him to help you to love them more. To increase in love for them. This is different than the world. Uh, Eric, I think it goes all the way back to chapter 1, verse 1. It, it, it has already said your work, work of faith, faith labor, yeah. love, perseverance. I think he said that in one verse. And then in verse 6, your faith so it seems like they've arrived, but here he goes, not quite. No. So whatever you're doing good, you can do it more. Right. He's constantly saying, okay, you do this, but here's more. And we want God to increase that in you. And again, what do we do? We automatically see who's the one that's ultimately bringing about all this growth. God is doing it. Prayer assumes what about God? He's the worker. He's the one that's doing it. He's causing this. Right? Good stuff. And we conclude with this last verse. What is the stated purpose of their increased love for one another and people? What's the stated purpose? Whenever I say purpose, what's that a cue for? So that. There you go. So that so that he may establish your heart without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Wow, lots there, right? Lots there. So what is this purpose? That they would abound in love for one another and for all people just as we do you. And so that God may establish your hearts. 
establish, make it firm that your heart, without blame, so you won't, when you stand before God, there won't be, ah, oh, you didn't really love people. You didn't really care about anybody but yourself. They establish your hearts that you would be without blame in holiness, in set-apartness. Right? So now the question is, is, I thought they're already holy ones. Aren't they saints? Are they already saints? Yes. Positionally. But there's also what? Here. That God would confirm and establish and fix more and more this increased love that would what? Make you blameless before God and set apartness before you stand before God. So it's a both and, isn't it? That in these bodies of death and holiness before God our and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus, which is when? In the future. In the future. When's that going to happen? When Christ steps out on the cloud, that you'll be ready when Christ comes back, that you'll be set apart, blameless, holy before. But what make, makes this established purpose to be established and be set apart for God when he comes back? What is it? It's that you will increase in love and abound towards one another, that you'll be loving one another. I guess the question is, is when do we get established? <laughs> when we die. <laughs> it's almost like he's building this, building this established rock-solid center of who we are that we can stand before God blameless throughout our whole life. We're growing in grace and knowledge. We're understanding more. Our faith is growing. Our love for others is growing. I heard somebody t tell me this week when we were talking at the elders meeting, one of the elders brought it up that said, um, he said that, you know, I don't think anybody really gets it. Uh, he, he was quoting an old dead guy that loved Christ, an old pastor. No one really gets it about real love and sacrifice and understanding God and enjoying him until they're after 65. I was like, really? Can people really get it earlier than that? <laughs> well, Stephen got it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the point is well taken, that we're always a work in progress, aren't we? We're all got a long ways to go, a million miles to go. We're still trying to learn and grow and understand God and love one another better and increase in that love. And be established in holiness, blameless before our Lord. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, it does. It's the sanctification process, I think, is what we're talking about here. The progressive part. We are positionally sanctified when we're, but there's this progressive nature of how God is making us more and more like his son. And as we look more and more like Christ, then we're established blameless at his return. Got a long ways to go on that, though. Yes, ma'am. Can you see the
Amen. thank God for what he has done and that he caused it all <laughs> and when you get to heaven you're not going to go I did it you're going to go you did it <laughs> way to go God <laughs> thank you right amen amen and so we're caused to pray let's pray Father we thank you we thank you for bringing us to this spot. We know that where we are is exactly where you want us. And that you're able to work in our hearts and have. Even when we've wanted to put the Bible in a, a, a brown paper bag and throw it in the trash. You still caused us to continue on. And your grace is sufficient. And you are kind and loving and gracious to us. I confess, Lord, sometimes I, I wonder why. You know, why would you love a sinner like me, a worm such as I? But then I'm reminded it's for your glory and for your goodness. And you show yourself off in this world and save sinners like us. And for this, we worship you. We praise you. And we ask that you will help us to abound still more and more in real knowledge of your son and grow in grace and knowledge and love one another more and love all people just as the apostle Paul loved the Thessalonians. God, help us to love like you love us. Help us to be established firm and be blameless upon your re return, Christ Jesus, that we will be firm standing firm in the faith set apart from this world and ready to see our master we long for your return come quickly lord jesus we praise you for tonight we pray all this in jesus name amen